Hey, this is John Reed. I have a totally surprised guest for you guys. We've been hovering around this topic for years now, project failure and what to do about it. I've got Joshua Greenbaum. Hey, John. What's going on? Um, surprise, here I am. We were at SAP TechEd, but we're not going to do the SAP TechEd rundown because we don't have time. I'd, we might work a little bit of that in, but we're actually going to be talking about uh, your startup, ProQ, and what you're trying to do, tr how, how you're trying to disrupt the world. Yes. Yes, can um, and and it's slowly but surely. Actually, the world is disrupting in our direction. That's that's rather than we disrupting it, it's disrupting itself, and we're there to hopefully save it. Yeah, and uh, for those of you that don't know, Josh and I have known each other for a long time, but we haven't been friends for a long time, so it's kind of weird. Like when I first saw Josh around the circuit, I would see him at some SAP shows, and I'd be like, "God, this guy's ridiculously well connected. I hate him." Because at the time, I was just like struggling to like get a media pass. This was in my early days of being on the circuit. and uh, But we just didn't know each other that well. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't that we were unfriendly. We just weren't no. friendly. Yeah, yeah, How's yeah. That? Is that a good, yeah. good line? Yeah, but, um, but, but these days, you kind of wear two hats because you still go to enterprise shows and, and you blog sometimes about what you're seeing in the market. Oh, yeah. But your main focus, as I understand it, is, is ProQ. So. Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, as, the, uh, as a guy running this startup, um, which is, you know, has this massive non-existent revenue stream, I am also doing my day job because yeah. that's, I, you know, I'm I, I, dream. Strapping. I'm bootstrapping exactly, right. but um, but I have you know it's the nice thing about it is that the, the day job and the and ProQ really overlap because ProQ really got started from frankly a, fr a long standing professional frustration about what what happens when projects fail and how does that get reported and more importantly how does that get remediated and mm. to me the thing that was always irksome when you see these and you don't see enough of them uh, but when you see project failure stories. Usually you see a headline that says the vendor did it. Right. Usually the systems integrator's name is nowhere to be found. Right. And often the customer, curiously, is kind of, you know, pointing the finger everywhere but at themselves and, and kind of spreading the blame around. And, and that's not really how the real world works. And um, one of the things I really got frustrated with is the idea that there is, you know, it, it, it takes two, if not three, parties to really screw up a project. And in fact, most project failures really have, um, you know, have three parents actively participating in the failure. Um, and, and I think that, that rather than, I mean, the idea is not to shame anyone it's to, and, and to, you know, to, to kick, kick their butt is to really say, can we fix this problem please? Because it's, it's kind of crazy that, I mean, the numbers are, the numbers in the on-premise world is where we started, and of course, it's transitioned, unfortunately, to the cloud world. Two thirds of all projects basically don't don't do what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Abject failure is a complicated thing to right to quantify as is success, but we know they're not meeting expectations. And the the promise of the cloud didn't fulfill, didn't change that. It's still the same problem. We still see right. this massive problem. Yeah, failure. and I think I think we have to be a little aware that we we can use the term failure a little bit loosely in some context but what i see a lot is just underperforming projects and when i talk with customers it is so rare that i get a true roi story in the enterprise software space especially around erp i, I see smaller successes like oh you know we increased leads by 25 percent or right. what have you but when you talk about a transformation project right. where people are now saying you know what we have different visibility into our business here's how we're making money here's how we're making better decisions and we have all the numbers to show it you know, I see very few yeah. of those stories, well, but, I see, yeah. but I see a lot of stories and I talk to a lot of customers where I'm like, really? Like, you know, and, and, and one of my big things is like, I just feel like projects don't come up for air enough. That's my big concern about e enterprise projects, especially ERP is, is like, okay, you have a prime vendor, you put a lot of trust in them and you're heading well down this road. Why aren't you getting regular checkups? And what does a checkup look like? I mean, to me, that's what I don't know if that fits in with kind of how you think, but that 100% to yeah. me is what because it's like the course corrections and the opportunity to kind of evaluate where you stand is what's important. Absolutely, and I think you know, and let me let me just you know, I want I want to agree with you 100% on the term failure. I don't really talk about failure yeah. when we talk when we we talk about ProQ. Again, I, I very carefully, and it's, it's not it's not I'm not I'm not BSing. I'm being really honest. We, 
we talk about f the inability to meet expectations, that there was a set of expectations for a project and they're not being met. They're not being met. And those expectations are a complex set of you know, time, budget, and, and, and functionality, the transformation you allude to. So it's really not, it's not about abject failure. It's hard to say what failure or abject success is. Right. But this failure to meet expectations is really what, 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 where it starts and obviously when things go really bad and you end up in court or you end up on the front page of you know the wall street journal or something yeah that's true failure but in between true failure and and true success is a is a whole lot of muddy water yeah. that that really is is i think tarnishing the industry and and wasting a ton of money and time on the customer side right so take us back in time to you you had a notion that from your day job <laughs> which we call the, the world of punditry that we're, that we're living in, you had a notion that you could make a change here. So how do you do that? Well, so, you know, I started this uh, with, with a mutual friend, Michael Doan. Yep. Let's yep. give him credit. Cause, um, and, and the original, the original story is interesting because we, we know this other company, Raven Intel, who I'll plug here and they're, they're yeah. really doing, they're actually doing what we think, I thought maybe we should do it first, which is, and I have the file, I just found it recently, is yelping the systems integrators. Now, right. now I, I, I pick on the systems integrators. And they're focused right now on the HCM they're, cloud they're, world. Right. And I just did a podcast with them as well, so you can you guys can check that out. But but their model is not tied in the long term necessarily to HCM cloud. No, like no, you right. Said, they a, could, it's, it's yeah. you know, I'd like to say that these, these are issues that you could use to you know, deconstruct a, a, a bridge yeah. construction project or, yeah, you know, yeah. anything else. But the idea was, the, the, the initial idea was we need to put some, you know, shed some light, bring some daylight into these processes. Um, Michael Doan had done a lot of survey research in the uh, project area and actually had a methodology for post hoc implementation analysis. Right. And I went to him and I said, hey, what if we took that post hoc survey and turned it into an in process during the project of effectively what we came up with the weekly, what we call post check, mm. a very simple, easy to, to fill out survey that sends this, this notice every week to all this important stakeholders. Here's how we're doing. And in mm -hmm. particular, the thing that Michael had analyzed, which I think is really germane to what we do uh, at ProQ is, is he looked at teamwork and the, you know, it's almost it's the missing leg of the stool, right? We have budget data, we have we have uh, you know on time data, we have we have task related data, but none of that matters if these teams aren't working together. Yeah, and I just want to elaborate on that a little bit because I think you and you and Michael, who's no longer with your company, but obviously had a lot of impact in the beginning. I think you guys had. Well, a, he's still a founder. Yeah, yeah we right, don't. We don't. He's not yeah. like active. No, he's not active running in the program right. company at the moment. Um, he's doing some other interesting stuff, which you guys should seek out online, but that's a different story. Um, but um, the thing I liked about the partnership of the two of you is that obviously you're, you're on the ground every day, like doing what you do. And what I've seen Michael's maturity assessments that came before you guys built this and right. they're very, very in depth. And one of the biases I really like about Michael is that he always looks at business user satisfaction, right? So he, he rebels heavily against. He doesn't even like the word user. He gets kind of angry. Oh yeah, yeah. Users are in, the only users that are in the drug drug right. delivery business or he something get, like he gets that. A right, ticked yeah. off. Right. So, but but I really like that that your methodology came out of that because it's not just about an IT project with a kind of limited IT scope. Right. Kind of looking at, hey, if business users don't adopt and thrive on this. You know, one of his big themes is thrive after go live. Right. Ironically, Michael isn't the biggest cloud advocate, but that thrive after go live thing is really where software is headed when you think about cloud, right? Which is like, you can't just walk away after you flip the switch. And, Nothing and is done at go live. Yeah. Go yeah. live is just the beginning. Right. Yeah. So you built this. Right. And, um, and, 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 <laughs> and then we, we walked right into a culture war. And, and, and full steam with, you know, frankly, and I, and I, I sort of laugh at myself as an industry analyst. I'm supposed to, I, I knew this, right? I used to always say that the hardest thing to do in enterprise software is to get someone to do something they've never done before. The easiest is just to take the thing they're always doing and make it faster, better, cheaper. Right. We were trying to really change the game and change it in a fundamental way, which is to put transparency and accountability into these projects on a weekly basis. Turns out, People what? don't embrace that with open arms. Dang, they really hate it. I'm and, shocked. And and 
and particularly, I mean, the sad truth is if you, uh, and particularly in the field, and I hate to pick on the practitioners who do this on a daily basis, but fundamentally for a lot of folks, if you have done three projects in your life, this, the data is pretty unequivocal. Two of them haven't really delivered on their expected value. That's, that's you know, we're not talking failure. Um, and you've never been held accountable. Accountability uh, doesn't really go with this industry. And and you can take this, move this up to the the top of the food chain where these big global SIs live and breathe. And quite frankly, you know, let's be honest, they, they're involved in a lot of projects that are, are not doing that well. And in, in very, very rare circumstances, are they ever actually truly held accountable for the it? The ironic thing is that they pick up awards at most shows. Dang, while yeah. Their projects are, and they end up on the south. keynote stage and all that good stuff. Unbelievable. And, and yeah. I, <laughs> but, yeah, but we digress. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I just want to talk for a sec about the, the sort of exciting and cool part of this, which is how this can be used to be successful. So let's take a scenario where um, I, I guess you would look potentially at a systems integrator or a customer for a possible client for this. Or, or the vendor. One, or yeah, the I mean, a, any of the three primary okay. stakeholders can be the the, 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 so, the, so walk the, me through the actual this. customer. Walk, walk me through this. Like, let's say that we have a customer um, that, that embraces this, this methodology that you have. What would it look like to incorporate it into what they're doing? Well, it's a very simple... Um, process of saying the project and the truth is we we ideally like to start when the project starts right but we are we you know teamwork is teamwork we're only measuring teamwork so we don't care necessarily where you are in the project because you're still going to have a teamwork problem but the basics the basic process is very simple it's a cloud-based tool so you 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 spend literally 15 minutes setting up ProQ. we need to know who are your respondents are you need a respondent list and, and you need to have your viewers. You you got to socialize this stuff, right? It can't just be data that you hide, bury someplace. Uh, we need to know what your what your general what we call the frame is. Really, what you, what you're doing. What is your methodology? We don't want the task level information. We want to know on a weekly basis because we survey weekly. What is it you're working on this week? And um, the other key, there's a couple sort of pieces of secret sauce here. One of the main things is that there are there's four respondents on the customer side, the IT, the internal IT side, for respondents on the service provider side. If the vendor's involved, we have a triangle, but the idea is that they're, they're, they're responding about the other party. The customer saying, is the, is the service provider coming to the party with the right tools? Do they have mm. the right methodology? Are they doing what I need them to do in order to be successful? And vice versa, and this is the key, because no one, we're all reluctant to hold the customer accountable too the SI and or the vendor gets to say the same thing. That data is, is again, it's a, there's 11 questions. It's pretty fast. You'd fill it on your phone or on, a, mm -hmm. on your browser. It's, it's tabulated and a, a weekly report goes out uh, to, again, whoever, whoever you've designated. We'd like to think that anyone on the steering committee who's interested, you might, mm -hmm. if you're in a public sector environment, you may have, goodness, uh, inspector general or a city council person might want to know how this stuff is going. Um, and that transparency is meant to, at a minimum, start the dialogue going, hey, we had a bad week, that's okay. Two, three bad weeks in a row, we got a problem. Let's, let's try to deal with this. We have some indicators. We'll tell you where some of these problem areas are from our, our, our data. And go, go at least sit down and have that conversation. Try to remediate it um, at whatever level, ideally at the project level. But if it ends up at the steering committee, Mm -hmm. If it has to, great. You've got data that says we've got a problem. Let's deal with it before it turns into a disaster. So would you potentially be helping to facilitate that? Absolutely. So you could come yeah. in as well. And, well, we would. We would. But you know, we can we can provide consulting services on top of it. But but right. it's meant to be self service. Self service. It's, right. It's really should be pretty obvious. Have a conversation. So you're you sparking a, a conversation. What would be an example of a, an indicator that that would help to sort of spark that? Well. You know, one, one of the things we always ask every week is, how do you feel about go live? What do you feel about post-implementation today, this week, right now? Mm -hmm. And we found, obviously, that's, that's a pretty critical question. If the customer starts, feel, you know, is already is nervous that they're not going to be successful, that the change management, the organizational change management is going to work, that should, be, that should be a red flag. You should never be in the position where the customer doesn't think this is going to be a successful project. Right. You better have a conversation. If there is a technical problem, we're asking, you know, the technical lead, how's it going on the technical level? 
again, if there's technical issues, we've seen this. We actually did a project where, and this is rare, where we turned on ProQ and bang, week one, we started having huge problems. It was, uh, again, the change management, the customer saying, we don't think we're going to be successful. We asked three questions about product. Is it the right technical fit? Is it the right functional fit? And is the vendor a positive value add? Mm -hmm. Those indicators were down, way south. Mm -hmm. Um that was like, that was red flag from week one. Very rare. It turned out that was a tool problem. It was a cloud migration project. They were using a tool that wasn't working and they had over promised. You know the story, right? Oh, we can migrate all your historical data to the cloud. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, so, so bang, you know, flashing red lights from the get go. And we predicted the, unf you know, not the demise of the project, but this project had to be put on hiatus uh, about five weeks, five, six weeks into it because they, they ran into this, you know, this blockade about data. Mm. Uh, they could have probably, you know, figured that out in week one because they had our data. Yeah, I, th I think the thing that I would hope to come out of uh, a podcast like this for anyone who's on the fence about this is that I do think that customers are, are, are more empowered. I mean, there was this notion that, you know, software generally is trending cloud. And by cloud, I don't just mean where the software lives. It's a different methodology around implementation that, that that avoids the kinds of customizations that really lock customers in with the vendor because once you're so heavily customized it's so difficult to contemplate ever moving right um, when you look at cloud you do have to look at think about re-earning that business every year and and it doesn't remove locking but it does improve choice and and if customers get fed up with and your business users are not adopting they will move to something else. And I had a very interesting session with a, a SaaS vendor, I won't name, that's somewhat of an industry darling not too long ago. And they were having some, some surprising sales issues. And their CEO said one of the issues was, we thought we were good with go live, but it turns out that we were, we were kind of taking away t the team, the go live team too soon. And the customers wanted us around for another like three months. Well, it took them a year to figure that out. And in the process, a lot of implementations didn't didn't pan out. Yeah, didn't pan out, and and you lose reference customers, and you lose momentum, and you lose that renewal contract two yeah. years down the road. I mean that that's what's exactly. interesting about the cloud is that in the you know in the old days, <laughs> the old days you could you know you could literally book the revenue, right, and and walk away and let the systems integrate and the customer d duke it out. Now you've got to have a successful implementation in the cloud because your your total value of that contract doesn't get expressed until probably the second renewal, not even the first, mm. you know, five years down the road, that's when you're really going to capture. And in fact, if you're doing a good job, you're not just going to renew, you're going to augment, you're going to add on, you're going to have this positive customer experience that's going to generate further revenue. If you screw up the implementation in the cloud, you, you know, two years down the road, what's the customer going to do? At, yeah. a, at a minimum, they'll say, well, we're not, you know, we're not going to expand the way we thought we're going to keep this, at the minimum level, or as you said, they, they could theoretically start looking at another solution. Right. They're not locked in. So if I'm a, if I'm a vendor, for example, or a systems integrator, and I want to retain that business, I want a checkup like this. I, I, it's, it's hard for me to wrap my, I, I understand the politics of this and that it can feel like someone from the outside, like bringing in like a, sort of an intervention, almost like, like we sometimes have to do with like, yeah, you know, drug addicted relatives or something. But, yeah. But, but, but on some level you would want this because you would want to take action and not allow these things to, I, it's hard for me to wrap my head around why there's resistance. I, I get well, let it. Me, let me tell you, let me be honest. Okay. At the top levels of pretty much every company we talk with or work with, there is unanimity around the fact that this, this visibility and transparency is needed. Mm -hmm. They suffer from the same problems, <laughs> you know, that everyone else has, which is that down at the field level, there is, this is a culture war and it's a culture war happening inside their company, literally, and inside their partner network, inside their com customer network. Um, so I, I get a lot of, I've had a lot of support from a lot of s top tier vendors in the, in the, in the, in the market for ProQ, but they themselves have trouble affecting that level of change. It's so dramatic. And this is, again, my I sort of laugh at myself. Right. I go, I, I should have anticipated this, but if probably if I had, it probably wouldn't have even started. Well, and I think what is what is really interesting about that is that, that a lot of uh, software vendors right now in the enterprise space sell 
their software in the context of, of transformation. Usually it's kind of a dual theme of you're being disrupted and you need to transform. And what I have sort of tried to emphasize is, is that you also need to transform. Yep. <laughs> the software vendor needs, and I don't care if you're, if you're cloud or not, the current SaaS model is not the end state. It's nowhere near the end state. It, it's not on demand. You're not free to walk away. It, it's not ultimately, I think, where software is going. You're going to have to change too. It's a business model transformation for you. And the same thing with your partners. And a lot of times, it's the partner community that I think is the furthest behind. 100% agree. In a lot of these, in a lot of these areas. And so it's like, you got to take that transformation message and turn it back on yourself. And I think, to me, that's a positive thing, but, but some, some shy away from it. But why not be open about it and say, hey, we're going through this as well. You know, like... And, yeah. I, and, and I think, and, 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 I, and, and I agree, the, the, the problem, and the problem a lot of the vendors have is, and again, the, I think the, 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 the willingness is there at the top, but, the, you know, the global systems integrators are a enormously important channel for these guys. In fact, they're yeah. much more of a sales channel than an implementation channel in a funny yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they, you know, and they have more account control in a lot of major accounts. So... Now these, we're on to one of Jarrett Pazahonic's big talking points, yeah, which is brother Jarrett, yeah, which is <laughs> which is the lack of accountability. Um, that you know the, the vendors, a lot of vendors have trouble reining in their well, their SIs. they don't have. I mean, the, you know, a lot of these GSIs are you know three, four, five, six times bigger inside an individual account than the vendor. Yeah, by definition, you yeah. know the 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 the, the you know the, the, that that is what are you going to do? You know, if you're if you know, I mean. You should be looking out for the integrity of your brand every single day, mm. and and I and I really think that this is where the the rubber hits the road. Is that these you know the at the end of the day, it's the vendors going to get smeared. They're going to get the headline. The SI is going to walk away. Um, I don't know how long you can continue that in the cloud without it really starting to having material impact. Yeah, absolutely. And I, the one thing I did want to hit on is I do think that the evolution of project failure in our industry is interesting because when you go back to the 90s and you look at failed products, there were some good examples of failed projects that where the software simply wasn't capable of doing what vendors claimed it was doing. I don't find that very often anymore. Yeah. I think, I think that what I do find sometimes is that there's still problems with software selection. Right. So in other words, like I still see examples where vendors... Where, where customers purchase the wrong product. Yes. And, and that puts them in a tough spot. So, so I think that still happens. And they were oversold. Right. Overzealous yeah. sales. Yeah. We're, we're going to, you know. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just one. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Gentlemen. Hey, guys. Gentlemen, who's cursing? No, no. It's a, no, it's we're not a, cursing. We're just asking it. We're just doing a recording here. If you can just be a little quiet that would be really great we'll be done in like three minutes would that be all right thank you maybe i'll leave that in that's always fun yeah right the, str right. the struggles that we get for for quietude it's, um, yeah, this in is a, a big this convention center this is, in the this is of, a yeah. new one tape measuring windows so i still think that happens right. and I, I guess your tool isn't really designed for that part right usually usually would you would people even use your tool during software selection no no, I don't think we're a selection tool right. per se. I think that that because because again, it's a teamwork tool. Yeah, yeah. But I think that that you know we can we can. That's where Raven Intel can help. That Raven can definitely be part of that, and and event. You know, the thing about about ProQ, and I and I want to say where 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 we we have a really nice, I think. Uh, future with with Raven and our, our mixing our data together is that when you start we we, we every, one of the first questions we get every time we talk to a new customer is can we change the questions these are good questions but we want to ask mm. some other questions and actually version 2.0 which we're working on right now will allow you to add a couple of questions but we have a very like what did you enjoy the corporate picnic or <laughs> yeah right. or yeah do you like yeah did you like yeah. the did you like the color of the t-shirt you got when we birthday went party on? right um, <laughs> I, you know. That's a that's a different story. I mean, right. uh, but but the point being that we have a, we have the same standard eleven questions because we want to be able to take that data, anonymize it, and use it to, you know, to to look at the metadata issues that come out of these projects. What what methodologies work and don't work, and in what industries, what pairings of vendor and service provider are better than others? Where is a particular service provider strong? Where do they need a little help? Uh, and and we, we have the, we'll have the project data 
in process, right? Raven's going to have the, you know, again, the, the survey data, the post hoc's data, how did the project go together? It's a pretty powerful set of data. Um, and I'm pretty excited about it. So we have that, we have that ability to have influence in the decision making process because we're going to be able to, as we get a statistically valid quantity of data, be able to help you as a, as a customer say, right. do I want to go with this vendor and this, and this service provider to do this kind of project? ProQ has this data, Raven's going to have this other data, and together you're going to have an infinitely more intelligent decision than you can make right now. Yeah. Which I think is mostly made on the golf course or, you know, in, the, in exactly. you know, over dinner somewhere. Well, and this, and you, both your companies, I, uh, I hope you guys both find ways of succeeding and, and sort of helping each other have bigger impact. And it, it all fits in with kind of a general sort of axe to grind. One of my biggest things in the enterprise is, is that projects need more independent expertise on site of many varieties from subject matter experts to project audits we need to get away from this single dependency i don't care if you pick the perfect si and the perfect software vendor you still need other gut checks on a regular basis from other kinds of folks and i do realize that makes projects more complicated i'm not going to be naive and say that that, is, that it doesn't create political challenges at a certain point but a political challenge and facilitating that is 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 the right challenge i i'm I, what i'm realizing now more and more as i do this and watching the pushback and watching and the success as well is that what we really are failing as an industry to do is focusing laser focusing on customer success as the ultimate challenge we you know unfortunately too many of the public companies are trying to make the numbers for the quarter right. and and proud of that um, too many SIs are trying to, you know, get, get on keynote stage with a pat on the back and, yeah. and show how many deals they're doing. And, and we're forgetting the fact that actually we're, we're supposed to be making companies successful. Dang it all. Isn't that, yeah. isn't, wasn't that what it's all about? Yep. And yet you have a bit of a chip on your shoulder about net promoter scores and stuff. So we have to reconcile some of your well, kind of customer satisfaction critiques. Well, customer sat is a complex. Listen, I have a survey research background. I cut my teeth in survey research out of college. I know it's really easy. We're, we're, we're professional. We're professional question askers, right? Yeah. We ask hard questions. You know, you can, you can game a question to get the response you want. And, and I, you know, we, we, yeah, you saw this sort of Twitter thing that going on with this, one of these vendors. Yeah, if you ask the wrong question or the right question the wrong way or the wrong question the right way, you'll you'll game the response right. full stop. That's easy as pie. So what's the alternative? How do we track how do we track the health of a project? Well, I mean obviously I, I mean you better. sort of said it in in a nutshell. It's about transparency and accountability. Yeah. The more openness, the more you surface these stuff, the more you right. put it out there. Um, look, and, and this is a, there's a third partner to ProQ. I want to call out Bruce Blitz, who's who's a former CIO and been been in, a CEO of multinational companies. And Bruce always makes the point that hey, nobody actually shows up, <laughs> you know, to the job to to fail. But also, but right. people don't show up to the job with the tools to succeed necessarily either. And I think that's a big difference. And and if you and 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 they don't have the cover, they don't get the cover to to. to to blow the whistle when things aren't aren't going well right. without fear of losing their job. So we we yeah. got to do something about that as well. Well, I agree because I think when I look at the customer accountability piece in this, I see two obstacles. One is that folks generally aren't empowered to speak up in a lot of cases. The rank and file on projects that could have an impact are not empowered right. to do that and they're scared to do that. And I think that's really unfortunate. And then the other thing is I think sometimes even the best meaning sort of enterprise project workers, if you will, um, are a little too heads down for my taste. I, I want to see more intellectual curiosity around what everything means. Um, what, what, what is the future of work? That actually matters. What, what is the future of your customer base? What is the future of your industry? Like these topics are not just like luxury analyst topics. They do matter. Yeah. And, and the roadmap of your vendor is a big one too, right? And that's why I love it when I meet customers at shows who are, I've been interviewing a couple this week at, at SAP TechEd who are really actively engaged with SAP on what they need. And they're going to sessions and learning stuff and making connections and they're presenting. And I'm like, I, I don't know that that guarantees our success, but I do like that path. And I like and, companies that cultivate that. You know, and now. we were at Success Connect recently, um, and and I was very impressed with with one of the one of the presenters on stage there, who then I got to talk to afterwards, who who basically, you know, she she said we we expected there were going to be some issues, yeah. we planned for it, 
We right. didn't think this was just going to be a, a walk in the park. Right. And, and you know, in the long run, uh, I always say it's, it's not a joke, it's true. Most of the conflict he, between humans is about a failure to set and meet expectations. Sure. And I think that's it. You know, when you, when you stand up and say, well, I have a 98% customer satisfaction rate, you're setting an expectation that everything's going to be perfect. You, I'm sorry, that's, that's a mistake. You're not, you be, mm. it better to say, hey, uh, you know, we, we know this stuff is hard. We know it, ain't, it doesn't just march out of, a, you know, out of a box and turn itself on and, you know, everybody, you know, goes right. and holds hands and sings kumbaya. We got to stop that. Let's be real about what really is needed, which is hard work and a little fail forward fast kind of mentality. Yeah. And now you're wading into a workday success factors debate around a customer satisfaction that we do not have time to go into today. Dang. Unfortunately, sorry, no, no, listeners, gonna, it would be, we're going to skip that. One. It would be okay. fun to, to get into it further. But, uh, but, but I think ultimately in those cases, the, the market does decide, right? Surveys, surveys, you know, come and go, but, but people vote with their wallets and their commitments. So we'll find out what happens. And we can have that debate sometime yeah. soon as and well. we can as well. All right. Yeah. Looking forward to that. <laughs> All, right. All right. We're going to get in trouble with our handlers if we don't get upstairs. But thanks to SAP for providing these. Be <laughs> We're actually recording this in beanbag chairs. Beanbags. So You'll see the I picture. Really it's super comfortable. <laughs> I really I'm, I'm going to take a that. nap when we're done. Thanks. All right, dude. Thanks. All right. Thank you, man.